Uh, good morning. Let me uh, draw us to attention there, and let me give you a very warm welcome. If we've not met, my name's Maddie. I'm the minister here at Dingwall and Strathpepper Free Church, and it's my great privilege to welcome you this morning. You may be investigating Christianity and looking for answers. You may be a struggling believer who needs strength and reassurance, or you may be a hungry Christian who wants to know and to love Jesus more. Whoever you are, Whatever kind of week you've come from, our church is for you, and we welcome you in Jesus' name, and we pray that in your time with us, you'll know something of his love and his grace. The theme of our time together this morning is that God has made us his people. We read these wonderful words of reassurance from the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's the wonderful assurance that all who trust in the Lord Jesus have. And so as we come together in Jesus' name, it's right in response to God's mercy that we sing God's praise. And we'll do that first by standing to sing words from the 100th Psalm, the old 100th, all people that on earth do dwell. Uh, no, it's the modern one. Shout to the Lord with joy, all who to earth belong. Adore the Lord with joyful hearts and come to him in song. So as we're led, we'll stand and sing together to God's praise. Thank you. 
join our hearts together in prayer. Father God, we thank you that in your kindness, that in your mercy, that you have made us your people. That though we do not deserve this, if we come before you trusting in the Lord Jesus, we can be confident that we who were not our people are now indeed your people. And so we pray that as we read earlier, you would help us to proclaim your excellencies among one another in the life of our church and to our communities and the outside world around us. But Father, even as we give you thanks for the work that you've done to make us a people through your own possession, we also confess before you how needy we are of your mercy. We pray that you would continue to have mercy upon us as we call to mind the many ways in which we feel to live as those who have been made your own people the many ways in which we have sinned against you in these past days. Father, we pray that you would forgive us. We pray that you would help us to walk with you in newness of life, to the glory of your name, trusting that you are our God, that we are your people, that we have received your mercy, and delighting, therefore, to live accordingly as we make known and live in response to your excellencies and your grace. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, confident that you hear us through him, Amen. Well, before our young people leave for their Sunday groups, I've got a a question I want to ask you this morning. Hopefully somebody will answer me. Who's the person you love most in all the world? Eleanor? Jesus, that's a great answer. That's brilliant. If we just set Jesus aside for now, not normally good advice, apart from Jesus, who's the person you love most in all the world? Isla, do you want to say? Are you hugging the person you love most in all the world? That's quite nice. (laughs) Anyone else? I can tell you who I love most in all the world. It's a tie. There's two people I love the most in all the world, and they're sitting over there. And when, when people ask you who do you love most in all the world, next question is how much do you love them? How much do you love them? And I love Jody, and I love Billy, at least this much, and if not, even more, maybe even to the moon and back. And maybe you love the people you love most in all the world, maybe you love them this much, or even more than that. This morning, we're coming back to something we haven't had in a few weeks, the catechism, which helps us learn things and remember things about God. And we see that the question and answer that we have this morning are about how much we should love God. So if you go to question seven, what does the law of God require that we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves? So this is helping us to remember something really important that Jesus said, that in God's word, the Bible, there are lots of rules. We call them God's law, and they're really important, but the really, really, really important thing is that we love God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength. We need to love God more than anything else in all the world. And that's not easy to do. And so we need God's help 
to help us to do it. And as we love God, we also need to show that love to other people around us as we treat people kindly, as we treat people like we would want to be treated, and as we share God's love with them too. So we need to love God as much as we can with all that we have, and we need God to help us to do it, and we need God to help us to love each other and to love other people. So let me pray to ask for God's help for us to remember that, and then you guys can head out to Sunday school. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that uh, you're the God who's worthy of our love, and we pray you would help us to love you with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength, and we pray you would help us to love each other and to love other people as much as you've loved us and as much as we love ourselves. Pray for the children as they go out to Sunday school, that you would help them to understand more of your word, the Bible, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening so well. Young people, you can head out to Sunday school now. And those of us who are staying behind, just a a brief pause as I flag up a couple of church family notices. Uh, The first of these is our spring series, this special seven-week Wednesday night series that we began this week. We had a really encouraging start as we began to think about this important question, what is church? You'll see on the next slide a a wee overview of where we're going over the next few weeks, and you'll see that this Wednesday night we're having a special prayer focus on church plants. So for that, we're going to be joined by Ennis McSween, who's the minister of Torner Green Community Church, a plant from Smithton over the other side of Inverness. He's going to come and join us and share a bit of the story of that church plant and how we can be praying for them. We'll also pray for other church plants around the country. Uh, That will be live streamed because that's not going to be as interactive as Wednesday night was, and this will be sharing a bit more from the front, and so we can live stream that. But let me encourage you, if you possibly can, uh, to come and join us in the hall and meet Innes and hear something of his story and the story of the church plant there. Uh, Then next thing is to remind us, as we see on the slide there, the AGM is on the 24th of April, so a week on Wednesday. There'll be a slightly shorter teaching session that night, and then we'll go into business after that's concluded. So 7.30 as normal uh, in church, and we will have our AGM uh, after a bit of teaching. Should also say, actually, uh, I forgot to say this last week, from 7.15 on Wednesday nights, we'll be serving tea and coffee before we begin uh, the evening proper. So do join us a bit early if you want a wee cuppa and a biscuit and a blether uh, before we get going. Uh, then one other thing uh, just to let you know about, uh, painting and redecorating. You may have noticed that we had a bit of a leaky roof through the winter. Uh, that has made us uh, reconsider that we need to well, we need to get that sorted, and we're going to do some decorating while we're at it just to spruce up that. And it's also sparked uh, the realization that we need to sort out this space to make it a bit more easy to host groups and events in here. So that will begin with some painting work, which will start on the 1st of May and might last a couple of weeks. It shouldn't cause too much inconvenience. Uh, it shouldn't really affect us on a Sunday, but if you see painters coming in, you'll know why. If you want to know any more info about that, speak to me or one of the Finance and Business Committee, and we'll, uh, we'd love to speak to you about what the plans are uh, for this space. Well, that's all by way of church notices for now. Uh, we're now going to return uh, to praising God in song as we come to Psalm 85 and verses 1 to 9. In times past, Lord, you showed favor to your own beloved land, the prosperity of Jacob you restored by your strong hand. Let's stand and sing together to God's praise. You will. 
me ask you to reach for a Bible and turn to Romans chapter 10. If you're using one of our church Bibles, that's on page 946, Romans chapter 10 and verses 5 to 17. And Marianne Fothergill is going to come and read that for us. And after that, Donald will come and lead us in prayer. So as Matty has said, you can find this on page 946, and it is chapter 10, beginning at verse 5, and it's entitled, The Message of Salvation to All. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them, but the righteousness based on faith says... Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek For the same Lord is the Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Amen. And may the Lord bless his holy word. Uh, Let's all join together in prayer. Our dear Lord God and Heavenly Father, we give thanks that we can meet here this morning, that we can engage in singing your praises, in listening to your word read and to your word preached. We ask, Lord, you would help each one of us to truly engage, to really focus on worshipping you this morning. And as we come before you in prayer, we lift up the needs of our church family, our community, of our nation. And we commit our church family to you. We, we, We all grieve for the recent passing of people who are dear to us and we ask that you would comfort us and draw close to those who have lost close family members remember uh, the mclean family the holland family mclennan family the mckenzie family we also commit to you those who have been bereaved in times past and who have had uh, painful memories stirred by by uh, recent events And although we grieve, Lord, we thank you that we can rejoice. We can rejoice that although we've lost members of our church family, that they are now in glory with you. So uh, whilst our hearts may be sorrowful, our hearts are also joyful. We lift up the housebound to you. We... we, uh, May they be aware, Lord, that we are mindful of them, that we value them. And we're conscious, Lord, many of the, uh, the housebound members of our congregation have served this congregation faithfully for, uh, for decades. So we pray, Lord, that 
we would be at one as a congregation, whether we're in the building or online this morning, that we are one congregation meeting together to worship you. We pray, Lord, for those who have long-term health conditions that are, are difficult. We pray, Lord, you would give them patience, that you would give them grace, that you would help them to, uh, to endure. We pray, Lord, for those around them, that you would make them insightful, uh, that you would make them insightful to uh, the needs of people who are unwell and that they would support them appropriately, mentally, physically, and spiritually. We pray, Lord, for those who are living with heart, those who are living with frustration. We ask, Lord, that you would enable us all to forgive as you have forgiven us so abundantly. We pray, Lord, we would not be like the ungrateful servant who receives abundant forgiveness but is unwilling to forgive for some small act, some small omission, etc. We thank you, Lord, for the new uh, series of uh, 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 of new series of uh, meetings on Wednesday evening. We thank you, Lord, for this new initiative. We take encouragement, Lord, to the many people who attended uh, on Wednesday and the good spirit that was there. We 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 uh, pray, Lord, you would put it on the hearts of many people uh, to to intend or in, engage uh, in these meetings. We pray, Lord, as we were just hearing from your word about uh, people need to hear your word to come to faith. We pray, Lord, that we would be equipped as, as a people, that we would be equipped, that we would feel um, confident that you would give us a boldness, that you would give us a confidence that we could witness to you and tell others the good news of the gospel, the free offer uh, of salvation. We pray, Lord, we'd have an impact on our community we pray, Lord, for our nurseries, schools, colleges, universities. We ask, Lord, that they would be open to your word. We pray for the chaplains, for SU, for UCCF. We commend all those to you, Lord, who, who work in ministry. We pray for school pupils and students as they prepare for exams. We pray, Lord, for the uh, work uh, we do as a congregation with many marvels. We pray, Lord, that we continue to attract parents and carers and children from our community, and it would be a gateway to the gospel for them. We pray, Lord, for our Sunday school that's uh, meeting just now. We thank you for each and every child that's there. We pray, Lord, for your protection for them. We pray, Lord, for, that you would lead them, that you would guide them. And we thank you, Lord, for all those who teach in the Sunday school faithfully from week to week. We bring the needs of our nation before you, Lord, and are conscious that um, there seems to be so much strife and division uh, uh, in our society just now. We pray, Lord, that you would bind us, you would bind us together. We pray, Lord, there would be revival throughout the land and that would bring, bring our nation together. And we pray, Lord, for our wider world. We pray for the all people, but particularly, Lord, we pray for the vulnerable, for the young, for the old in um, Gaza, in Ukraine, and uh, other areas of conflict in the world. We pray, Lord, that the we pray, Lord, that you would protect them. We pray, Lord, for protection for your church, for the persecuted church uh, in uh, Nigeria, other parts, other parts of the world also. And we pray, Lord, that there would not be an escalation to the conflict uh, in the uh, Middle East. It seems such a unstable situation. We pray, Lord, that you would you would um, intervene. That you would you would uh, give um, our political military leaders wisdom and guidance, such that uh, further conflict can be can be avoided. We pray, Lord, for, for protection for all your people. We're conscious, Lord, there are are so many needs to bring before you. Uh, we pray, Lord, you forgive us for our uh, omissions, and we seek your wisdom and guidance and blessing in all sections of our church, of our community, of our wider society. We bring all these needs before you and uh, ask you to forgive our sins. We ask in the name of your Son. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Marianne, for reading God's Word. Thank you, Donald, uh, for leading us in prayer.
Before we come to study God's word, as we return to Mark's gospel in just a moment's time, we're going to stand and sing again a prayer that God would help us to hear rightly and to understand from his word and help us to love him more. So as we're led, let me invite us to stand and sing, O great God of highest heaven. ask you to take up your Bibles once more and turn to Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 3 and verses 7 to 35 is where we are this morning. You can find that on page 838 of our church Bibles. So Mark chapter 3 and verses 7 to 35. And as we find our way there, let me lead us in prayer. Father God, we've just been asking in song for your help to help us to glorify you, to occupy lowly hearts and draw them towards you and your promises. We pray that as we come to your word, that you would indeed help us to hear it rightly and to understand that we might glorify you more. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Mark chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Edomia and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. 
Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him for they were saying he is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom can't stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Amen. And we thank God for his word. Well, if you've been following along in our series in Mark, if you were here last week, you'll know that we rounded off by looking at the growing opposition that Jesus was facing from the religious elites around him. Uh, the old order, the gatekeepers of old Israel, they are so full of outrage and hatred at Jesus that they plot to have him killed. And so our passage this morning, verses 7 to 12, this first little section, it gives us, first of all, a reassurance that hated as he may be, rejected though he is, Jesus' work goes on. We get this reassurance that the crowds still flock to hear him, to be healed by him, and the demons continue to shudder when they encounter him. Jesus' work is unstoppable. And really, throughout this whole section of Mark, from chapter 2, verse 18, to the end of this morning's passage, we are being shown that Jesus came to do a very particular and specific and new work. Jesus came to show how the old order was getting it wrong, to supplant them and to establish something different to what they were expecting. We saw that last week in terms of how Jesus interacts with the Old Testament law and interacts with the Jewish religious traditions that had sprung up around the Old Testament law. And this morning we see it in terms of how Jesus gathers to himself a people, redefining their understanding and maybe ours of what it means to be the people of God. There's reassurance then that though he remains hated and rejected by many in our world today, the work of Christ continues and it continues through his people. It continues through his church. And so as we look at this part of Mark together this morning, the hope and prayer is that we should leave feeling strengthened and feeling commissioned to share in the unstoppable work of Jesus. That's where we want to end up. And to help us get there, we're going to look at this passage under two headings. The first of which is this, Jesus' authority is rejected. I think I've used this quote before uh, from the front of church, but C.S. Lewis, the, the author and theologian, he once famously said of Jesus that someone who did the kind of things that Jesus did and made the kind of claims that Jesus made would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or a madman or something worse. That is often summed up as Lewis's mad, bad, or God argument. 
Uh, he didn't pluck those categories out of the air. We see that all of those reactions to Jesus existed in his own day. We see all of them, in fact, in this very passage, as Mark shows again how Jesus is rejected by people around him. Now, something Mark likes to do in his account of Jesus is to tell things using a sandwich structure, or if you're a bit fancier, using a chiastic structure. Sandwich is a bit easier to understand. Basically, what that means is he will take a couple of similar accounts on the outside of the passage as a commentary on what's happening in the middle. This morning, we're going to look at the middle of the sandwich first, and we'll see there that Jesus is rejected for being mad. Verse 20, then he went home again, and the crowd gathered again so they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. I don't know about your family. I find that my family are quite good at cutting me down in my moments of glory, at remembering me, reminding me of my humble origins and keeping me grounded. There's a scene in the movie yesterday. The premise of that movie is a a struggling singer-songwriter wakes up one morning and finds that everyone in the whole world has forgotten the Beatles, famous band, the Beatles. Everyone's forgotten about them apart from him. So he sees an opportunity. Struggling singer-songwriter, the only person in the world who remembers the Beatles songs, got to pretend that they're my own, got to become successful that way. There's a brilliant scene then where he's showing his mum and dad this new song that he's written, a song called Let It Be, one of the best songs ever written. And he's trying to play it on the piano, and his mum and dad do not care. Oh, that's nice. What's that called? Leave It Be, is it? As their friends come in and they make a cup of tea and they keep interrupting him. Here they have an opportunity to hear one of the greatest songs ever written for the first time ever, and they don't care. It's their son. It's just him doing his wee thing, playing his wee piano. Families can be a bit like that. What we find here, though, with Jesus' reaction, Jesus' family's reaction to him, it's not quite as gentle as, oh, well, that's just him doing his thing. He doesn't mean any harm. What we read in verse 21 is actually really, really forceful. The Greek language is strong. Seize him really does mean seize him, arrest him, stop him. It's not just, oh, don't listen to my boy. He's just in one of his funny moods. They really do think that Jesus has gone out of his mind. This reaction of his family is pretty extreme then. And it's also laying the groundwork for something that Jesus will say later in the passage about exactly what it means to be a part of his, to be a part of God's family. It's encouraging for us to know that this is not what Jesus' family always thinks. Wonderfully, throughout the New Testament, we see them coming to have real faith in him in spite of how well they know him. His brother James even writes one of the books in the New Testament. This is not where they end up, which is great. But the fact that their reaction is included here, it does show us something that we will see in the next few chapters of Mark even more clearly. Mark wants us to see That being familiar with Jesus is not the same as really knowing Jesus. After all, if even his own family, who will be more well acquainted with him than anyone else, if even they aren't automatically on the inside, don't automatically understand who he is and what he's doing, well, that's a challenge that we need to hear and reflect on. It is not enough to simply know lots of things about Jesus. It is not enough to be familiar with him and to keep him at arm's length. Mark and Jesus himself are calling us to something much, much deeper than that, as we'll see. His family think he's mad. They're familiar with him but they don't really know him. 
Theirs, of course, is not the worst reaction to Jesus here. If his family think he's mad, the Pharisees think he's bad. Verse 22, and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. We've already seen that the scribes, along with the Pharisees, they hate Jesus. They're part of the group that wants Jesus out of the picture. And it looks like the first part of their plan is this smear campaign against Jesus. After all, they can't deny that Jesus is doing amazing things. They have seen it. The crowds have seen it. People are flocking to Jesus from all over. We're told here because they know that he has healed many and driven out many demons. So they can't just say that's not happening. So how do they account for it? What is their reaction? Well, their reaction is that guy, Jesus, he's working for the other side. That guy, Jesus, he's working for the devil. He's an agent of Satan. This guy, Jesus, he's a bad guy. And Jesus responds, first of all, by exposing how ridiculous an argument that is. How can Satan cast out Satan? They've got no answer to that because, well, the answer is, of course, he can't. It's an unanswerable question. Why would he do that? It would be a ludicrous act of self-destruction, just like a kingdom in a bloody civil war or a house divided down the middle. Satan could not stand. He would be utterly finished if he went around and started to destroy his own works. Jesus is showing this is a ridiculous argument to make, a ridiculous accusation to throw at me. But within this, we also get this Wonderfully knowing statement from Jesus in verse 27. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. If demons being driven out is a signal that Satan's reign of terror is coming to an end, Well, even as he exposes the ridiculousness of this accusation, Jesus is continuing, as we keep seeing, to reveal more of his identity and more of his purpose. Their accusations are tragically ironic because Jesus is not a servant of Satan. He is the conqueror of Satan. Jesus is revealing himself as the one who really can bind up the strong man. His coming means that Satan is already defeated. His end is already sealed. And it's really important to remember that everything that Jesus says from verses 23 to 30 is in response to those accusations. He is both exposing the ridiculousness of their statements, the scribes, but he is also pronouncing on them a very, very severe and devastating judgment. That is the context, the really key context, in which we read verse 28. Truly I say to you, All sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. I know that these verses can cause a lot of confusion. They can also cause a lot of fear and insecurity. After all, who among us hasn't, maybe in a moment of deep anger, or grief, pain, or confusion, who among us hasn't found ourselves questioning God's goodness or maybe even railing against him in anger and rage? Or maybe for some in our pre-Christian days, maybe we know that we were in the habit of saying some very nasty and untrue things about God, making fun of him and calling him all sorts of things. If that's us, we can read these verses and we can feel pretty worried. The natural question, oh, is this me? Have I done this? 
am I now unforgiven and unforgivable? To which we need to say a few things to get really clear about what this unforgivable sin is. First, even within these verses, there is deep, deep assurance that Jesus gives to his people. All sins will be forgiven and whatever blasphemies. God's word repeatedly, consistently wants believers to have real and true and deep assurance that if they are trusting in Christ, their sins have been truly and actually forgiven. Uh, We begin our time here every Sunday morning by confessing our sins before God, by asking for his forgiveness. And usually we have some words from scripture to give us assurance that God doesn't just hear those prayers, that in Christ he has really, actually, truly answered them. And so though we continue to feel, though we continue to stumble and sin, sin does not define us anymore. That's the work that God has done in our hearts. And the Bible, God's word, consistently wants us, if we're trusting in Jesus, to have assurance of that. That's the first thing to get clear. And so, if you find yourself reading these verses and you feel really bad, you feel worried that maybe you have committed at some point in your life this so-called unforgivable sin, that very feeling of worry should be a sign to you that you certainly have not committed the sin that Jesus is describing here. The the very fact of being concerned that you may have done something to rob God of his glory is a sure sign that you have not committed this sin. And here's why. What Jesus is describing here is not a slip of the tongue or a careless moment. What Jesus is describing here is a settled, consistent rejection of God and a complete an unending commitment to seeing God as someone he isn't, an agent of evil. To put it another way, people who have committed this sin are not even slightly worried or slightly remorseful, do not care one thing for what God may think of them. But the main and the most helpful thing for us to remember and to understand here, is again to remember the context. Jesus didn't say these words in a vacuum. The context is so important. Remember, he's just been addressing these smears on him by a group of people who hate him, a group of people we already know want to kill him. Verse 30 is helpful. The reason he says all this, for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. It is to the scribes, this group, that he is issuing this devastating warning and judgment. If you continue on this trajectory, you are on a collision course with eternal sin, which won't be forgiven. That is how seriously they have failed. And that is where this passage connects with last week's passage. Jesus once again exposing just how much the current religious order of his day, these gatekeepers of old Israel, just how much they have failed, just how desperately the people need something more, something better. These people are not fit to shepherd and lead God's people as they should be. But there's also a really, really deep irony in the fact that, as we've already seen, they're accusing him of being a demon. In this passage, it is the demons themselves who actually recognize Jesus for who he is in a way that they don't. Jesus is not mad or bad. He is, in fact, God. That's what we see in verse 11. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. It's interesting that so far in Mark, it is only the demons who have been able to fully recognize Jesus. And he doesn't let them say anything. Shows us again his amazing authority. The demons know who he is. They've got no answer. There's no challenge they can mount. They know this is God's son the one with authority, the one who has come 
to defeat them. Jesus knows that people are not yet ready to understand the full implications of what the demons say here, of him being God's son. People are not yet ready to understand that he hasn't come to be an earthly king. He hasn't come to overthrow the Romans. He hasn't come to do anything like that. He has come to defeat Satan, sin, and death, as will become more and more clear as Mark's gospel goes on. There's a reminder in all of this then that, as we'll see again and again in the next section of Mark, it really does take a miracle to fully understand who Jesus is. So as I've often said, we need to be really humble. Those of us who are believers, those of us who do know Jesus, trust in him, love him, it is only by God's grace that we do. It is only by God's grace that we can recognize Jesus for who he is. And when we encounter people who don't, it is not that they are a bit dim and it's not that we are cleverer than them and they just need to go and work it out and sort themselves out. No, there's a need for us to be humble and to be thankful and to rejoice that God has opened our eyes to these things. And there's also deep assurance that in sending Jesus, in sending this strong man, this one with authority, God has truly defeated sin and death and Satan. This passage should do the opposite of making us feel insecure about unforgivable sins. Because if we're in Christ, this passage should give us real assurance that our sin has been conquered by God's conquering king. It does also ask the probing question, though. If you're someone here this morning who's not yet following Jesus, how are you viewing him today? As you read through Mark's account of Jesus' life, what do you think you're reading? Is this an account of a mad, delusional narcissist Is this an account of a bad guy, a con man who started a religion to build a name for himself? I want to suggest that that is not the Jesus we meet in Mark, that we are consistently being shown exactly who Jesus was and who Jesus is, the Son of God, the compassionate, conquering King over evil and death. If that's who Jesus is, let me invite you, as I I often do, if you haven't done so already, would you make this Jesus your king? Not a madman, not a bad man, but God in human flesh, the one, the only one who can solve the problem of our sin and rebellion against God and who promises to fully and actually forgive all those who come to put their trust in him. I would urge you, if you haven't done so, to please come before Jesus and know his forgiveness even this morning. Because after all, you don't need any qualifications or prerequisites to do that. And that becomes all the more clear when we consider the outside of the sandwich to remind us of where we are. Our second point, Jesus' people are called. We get a lot of signs in the verses on the outside of this section that Jesus, as well as denouncing the old order, is also calling to himself a new people and sending them in to a new work. The first sign that we get of this is in... Sorry, I might just turn this lapel mic off because... Happy to use this one? Great. Um, That's going to be a bit less distracting. So first sign that Jesus has come to call a new people into a new work is in verse 13. And he went up on the mountain. That seems like a fairly innocent detail. But actually, in the Bible, a lot of really significant things happen on mountaintops. Mountaintops are the place historically where God has revealed himself, where God has commissioned the patriarchs and the prophets. 
where God has demonstrated his power and authority over idols, where God has begun new eras in the life of his people. And so this location is actually really significant. Jesus going up on a mountain is a sign that God himself is at work to do something new. Second sign we get. He went up on the mountain. What did he, what did he do there? He appointed 12. Question for us. Who are the people? A few hundred yards away from us later today, some rowdy folks from Glasgow will be saying that they are the people. The Bible's got a different answer to that question. Who are the people? Who are the people of God? Well, in the Old Testament, the 12 tribes of Israel were shorthand answer to that question. It is no coincidence that this is the number of apostles that Jesus appoints. appoints 12. It is another sign that we are witnessing a seismic shift and a bold re-understanding of what it means to be part of the people of God. Here we have Jesus, almost like he's starting from scratch, reconstituting things, showing that he has authority to do something bold and new. If the number of the apostles is significant, their work is significant too. Verse 14, he appointed 12 so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He doesn't just call them, he commissions them to share in the work that he came to do. Remember, we saw that right back at the start of Jesus' ministry at the beginning of Mark. Why did he come? He came to preach. That's what he himself says. He came to preach. He came to call people to repentance, and he sends his apostles out to do the same. He accompanies his preaching with displays of divine authority and power to show that he really is teaching with the very authority of God and he sends his apostles out to do the same. These 12, these are the first movement of this work that Jesus is doing, bringing to full realization what the Old Testament actually always showed anyway but is now becoming fully made known that God's people are God's people by faith. Something we saw in the Romans passage that Marianne read earlier. God's people are God's people by faith, not by anything else. The apostles being sent out then, we could also think of them as the first movement of the church. We thought about what church is on Wednesday night, and basically it's just a group of people, an assembly of people in a particular place called, brought in by God, and sent out by him to tell people about him. That's what the apostles are commissioned to do here, going out to preach and to, with authority, call people to know God and to know forgiveness in Christ. And as they are commissioned, it is then in anticipation of what's going to happen after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, when the apostles will be responsible for taking the gospel to the very ends of the earth. Now, it is worth saying that we are not apostles. Not one of us is. In fact, if you encounter someone who claims to be an apostle, and he says, listen to me, I'm an apostle, I've got special status and, and authority from God. Don't listen to them. Be very, very suspicious. We see here that the apostles have a share in the authority of Jesus himself. This is foundational authority given by Jesus to go and establish his church and to take the gospel to every corner of the world. That is something unique and foundational given for them, and not something we should all expect to share in today. But as one writer has said on this passage, the church stands on the authority of Jesus and the authority of the apostles. Preaching and speaking the message remains the church's priority today. Driving out demons and performing other miracles is no longer required to establish authority because God's word has the authority. We are not the apostles. 
we should not expect nor demand signs and wonders from heaven because actually in God's word we have everything we need and though we're not the apostles we carry on their work the church again to say something I said on on Wednesday night is God's primary ordinary means of introducing people to Jesus and nurturing them in their lifelong following of him. That has big implications for how we do church, for what we do as a church, for how we should see church and see one another. In the midst of all the good things that we could do and and I guess should do as a church, we need to absolutely make sure that our priority It's proclaiming the message of Jesus, introducing people to him, and helping everyone to know more of him. That's who we are. That's what we're about. Lots of good and great things that we could do and will do, but one thing that we must do, carry on this work of proclaiming and preaching Jesus and the the forgiveness that he alone brings. We should also affect how we view church it's not just something that we come to on a Sunday it's not just an activity that we fit into our schedules it is God's kindness God's means by which he gives us assurance by which he grows us in our love for Jesus it is good to be together to serve one another in this regard and we do all this in confidence that we are not just partners in a firm We are part of God's household, part of God's people. We met Jesus' family a bit earlier. They come back into the story at the end of our passage. Verse 31, his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God He is my brother and sister and mother. Just a final reminder for us then that being part of God's people has nothing to do with observance of regulations, nor even does it have anything to do with birthright or lineage or family background. It has only to do with faith. It is to do with following and trusting in Jesus, and from that trust, doing the things that he commands us to do. It's when we do that, it's when we recognize who Jesus is, and have faith in him, and live a life of following him, and sharing in his work. We find truly, as I've often said, that we haven't just joined a club with some interesting activities, or started attending some weekly corporate events we have truly become part of God's family a family defined not by blood but by faith so if you're not yet trusting in Jesus a reminder here for you that that is the wonderful privilege being held out to you given to you not by virtue of your being a good person or following certain rules but only by God's grace if you come to trust in Jesus putting all your faith in him. You're invited not just to join a church, but to be part of a family. But for all of us, a reminder that as Jesus calls us as followers, he also welcomes us as family. And as he commissions us as family, it is our family business to go and tell all who will hear of him and of the forgiveness that he alone can bring. So as a family, let's pray that God would help us to go out and do just that, and let me lead us as we do that just now. Father God, we thank you that that Jesus, though he is rejected among us even today, he is also the one who calls us and commissions us to go. We thank you that he has called us to be part of your very family, And we pray that as a church family, you would help us to share in the the burden, the priority of Jesus and the apostles, to go and introduce him to as many as we can in our communities. We pray you would give us reassurance that Jesus has the authority to call us, to forgive us our sins, to establish us as your people, 
and send us out with that confidence and with joy to go and make him known. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, faith is the key word in what it means to be part of God's people, and it's a key word in what it means to praise God as we come to do that now in song. By faith, we see the hand of God. Let's stand and sing together to God's praise. may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen. <laughs>